us, and we are even more pleased and uh, privileged to have Dr. Irvin McLaren here with us today. Um, so I'm just going to quickly introduce Dr. McLaren, um, and then hand it over to her to take us through her the presentation. And Dr. Irma is still. Dr. Irma, check. <laughs> so Dr. Irma, um, who you can follow on Twitter, by the way, handle McLaren tweets. Uh, check it out. Uh, she is a woman of many talents. <coughs> she believes you must change, change minds, change behavior to achieve transformation. She is an activist anthropologist, academic entrepreneur, award-winning writer, diversity and inclusion champion, and CEO of, of Irma McLaren Solutions, or IMS. Her book, Black Feminist Anthropology, Theory, Politics, Practice and Poetics was named an outstanding academic title in 2002 by Choice Magazine and, uh, or, and, and in 2015, sorry. Uh, the Black Press of America selected her as the best in the nation columnist. In anthropology, McLaren studies the social construction of inequality in the African diaspora using the lens of intersectionality. She is a fierce supporter of cultural heritage preservation and has founded the Irma McLaren Black Feminist Archive at the University of Massachusetts Amherst to preserve the contributions of black women. She also has worked on the preservation of the historic African American Overland Cemetery in Raleigh, North Carolina, and in 2021 received an Engaged Anthropology Award for her work as a diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant, and lead anthropologist, on, and she's also a lead anthropologist on the Rochester Museum and Science Center's groundbreaking exhibition called The Change Makers, Rochester Women Who Changed the World. As a 2018 Fulbright specialist, McLaren taught black feminist and feminist theory from an American perspective, lectured on the Black Feminist Archive, and taught public writing workshops in Kerala, India. She holds a PhD and MA in cultural anthropology with a subfield in historical archeology span and an MFA in English specializing in poetry, all from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Her BA is in American studies from Brigham College. She, her current project is a collection of essays called Just Speak, Reflections on Race, Culture and politics in America, and it will be forthcoming this year. So, with further, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Irma. Thank you. So, it's so nice to see so many lovely faces here, and such a diversity of faces, and to be in this space. So, what I want to talk to you today about is building an archival home for Black women, and on the creation of a Black feminist archive. So every anthropologist has an origin story, and mine for the creation of the Earl of Horn Black Feminist Archive began consciously in 2014 when I made a cold call to the late Robert S. Cox. He was then the director of the Special Collections and University Archives in the W.E.B. Du Bois Library at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And I'll have to say that the library itself is one of the tallest academic libraries in the world. And to have it named after a black intellectual, especially a black intellectual who gave up his citizenship, moved to Ghana, and was considered a communist, is quite groundbreaking. Less than 24 hours after my call to Robert, I received a two page email expressing his delight over our conversation and his affirmation quote, This is exactly what we should be doing. At the end of last year, Rob died of rail failure. Now, skew up is called the Robert S. Cox Special Collections and University Archives Research Center. And it describes itself as, quote, an archive of social change, end quote. It holds the collections of Du Bois's papers, 99,000 plus items. And it recently acquired the papers of Daniel Ellsberg of Watergate Bay. It also is a repository focused on the quote, whole life of individuals, and I can tell you what that means later. I had originally approached Spelman College, a historically black women's college, one of only two in the United States, informally about depositing my papers. How many of you have heard of Spelman? 
movies. Okay. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> I can tell you now, uh, because I knew I, I, I can't tell you how, but I knew I had created work that was worth preserving at that moment, in that time. Spelman focused only on collecting papers of those women who had had a connection with the institution. E.g., many of these people were black women artists honored by Dr. Janetta Cole, then the first woman president of Stillman College. So you have a college for black women founded in the 1800s that had never had a black woman be president mm -hmm. until 1980s. Okay, and that was because the students locked the trustees in a room and said, how can you tell us that we are the best and the brightest, but you can't find anyone who's a black woman around this institution? Mm -hmm. So Janetta Cole uh, became became the first black president. She later became the president of Bennett College, which is the other HBCU for women. So she has the distinction of having been president of two historically black women's colleges. She is also a black anthropologist, and she wrote the foreword to my award-winning book, Black Feminist Anthropology, Theory, Politics, Praxis, and Poetics. She's also my mentor. It is largely because of her that I became an anthropologist. Because of Dr. Cole, Spellman holds the papers, her papers, those of Audrey Lords, uh, raise it. You've talked about knowing Audrey Lord. How many of you others have heard of Audrey Lord? Black feminist lesbian poet. Tony K. Bambara, Gloria Josephs, and many others. So those are housed in Spellman. Spellman does not talk about its collection as an archive. They just simply are the collections of black women artists. Without Spelman as an option, it was by accident that I was reading the UMass Library's magazine bookmark, and so not only did they have the papers of Du Bois, for whom the library is named, but also the papers of David Levering Lewis, who is the Du Bois Pulitzer Prize winning biographer, Arlena Bakian, one of the founders of women's studies at UMass Amherst. Do you know her work? Do you know her work? Okay. It seemed like there was good company for my papers in school. As a three-time graduate of UMass, I have an MFA in English that I received in 1976, and an MA and PhD in 1989 and 1996, and the fact that I had worked as an administrator for UMass for almost 15 years, I felt I had a right to be archived there. My children were born in Amherst, and I had lived there from 1973 to 1991. This was the longest place I had resided. It was as close to home as I could get, having lived in nine different states. So why a black feminist archive, you might ask? Let me preface why I make my remarks by saying my interest in archiving myself and other black women predates the Black Lives Movement, uh, Matters Movement by six years. Remember, I reached out to UMass in 2014, so this is well before everybody discovered that black women were the flavor of the month, right? <laughs> At that time, no one had any interest in preserving the lives of black women unless you had star power. So they wanted Alice Walker's papers, they wanted Angela Davis's papers, Maya Angelou's papers, but they didn't want her on Clark's papers. I wasn't famous enough. My catalyst was not the street protest or police violence, it was the simple self-recognition that my contributions were important and needed to be preserved. After all, if we do not believe in our self-importance, why should anyone else? And I have to say that part of that motivation was that I am first generation. My father had a second grade education. My mother graduated from night school the same year I did. In my extended family, I'm the first to go to college and get a degree. And I had that moment of reflection that if something happened to me and I passed away, my family would come to my house, they'd see this mess of what I call my workplace, write papers all over the floor. And if you want to see what that looks like, I have a, on my YouTube, I have a video called Way Go Do Your Stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so you can like go through my stuff and show you papers on the floor, papers in file cabinets. I got a lot of stuff, right? And I thought, without any male intention, they would say, we just need to clean this up without understanding the importance and the power of what was in there. Poems that never got published. Uh, 
you know, manuscripts that, you know, didn't, didn't necessarily get accepted into magazines because at that time, nobody wanted to hear what the black voice was saying. Uh, unfinished papers and things like that. So, I want to ask you, if we do not believe in our self-importance, why should anyone else? How many of you believe you should be our kind? Raise your hand.
Once I left that institution, I lost access. So the only story out there is now in someone else's platform. So I created my own independent website to be able to push that down. Believe it or not, they have never taken my website down. And there are people who actually believe that I still work there. <laughs> you know? So that's been kind of interesting. And so these are the things that you need to think about. So I'm telling my colleagues, you don't have to print out everything. If you do save, if you do print, you can actually save it as a PDF. But start thinking about the correspondence. I have like, someone who's going to put their cell in the archive. She says, I have all these correspondence with people from all over that if you don't save it, it's just going to disappear because once you're gone, no one else can get into your emails. Mm -hmm. And there are places, I had so much, I had a Hotmail address called Sorry No Hurston at Hotmail. But Hotmail had a thing, if you didn't use it readily, they wasted all your data. Mm -hmm. So I've lost a lot of stuff. But now I'm very mindful of that. So think about that. What these audit items contain, what these items often contain, which we sometimes discover in the process of archival excavation, because it is like an archaeological dig, are the backstories behind what the public sees. The public sees the finished product. Researchers seek the stories behind the finished products. What Lynn Edel once described in talking about writing biographies as the figure beneath the carpet, right? And so the backstory in the Beinecke Library, the original manuscript of Zora Neale Hurston's is there. And I'm looking at this manuscript, it's type manuscript, and there's a story about how it got there. But I discovered that the most powerful line in their eyes are watching God is when Janie's grandmother says her black women is the news of the world, right? That is an insertion on the back of the manuscript, handwritten. So it gives me a sense that Zora didn't just jump out and have these wonderful ideas. Sometimes she had to reflect and think about it and say, okay, I got something I want to say here, and it's an insertion. What power that is, as opposed to thinking it just kind of flowed from her, to know that she thought about it, reflected it, and went back and made like a, an amendment to that. In three words, archives protect and preserve voices. But whose voice do you make happen? The answer should be clear. For me, historically, it's not been ours, and by that I mean us black women. Because if the voices of black women were protected and preserved for immortality in archives, there would be no need for me to be doing the work that I'm doing, right? Last year, I spoke about the Black Feminist Archive at a conference entitled Centering Black Women's Voices. Had traditional mainstream archives and mainstream archivists done their work, there would be no need to speak of centering black women's voices. And certainly there would be no need for me to have my own archive. But we're not there yet, right? So what do archives mean? They mean different things to different people, depending on who is working in them and who is using them. To scholars and anyone who's interested in archives, there are again those treasure troves of secrets and data. We learn facts that are known, as well as little known details about people and places. Archives are windows that allow us to peek inside and learn something we didn't quite expect about specific people, places, and moments and times. We get to see the wizard's curtain those, how many of you know the Wizard of Oz, right? And Dorothy who then takes back the curtain and reveals that what everyone thought was this powerful wizard is just this old man. So archives allow us to take the curtain off of people. They tell us a story about privilege and access, who has it, that is access to archives, and who is not expected to have it. As Ashley Farmer reminds us in her 2021 Chronicle of Higher Education editorial, Archive You Are Black. She recounts the experience of that of the late black historian John Hope Franklin, that he had an archives which motivated him to become one of the most significant historians of the 20th century. How many of you know his work? Up from Slavery, John Hope Franklin. If you haven't read it, if you haven't seen it, then you're missing something. He is like one of the most definitive historians. He lived to be like 94. He wrote this in a 1968 essay, quote, to weave, he went to archives and became a historian to, quote, weave into the fabric of American history enough presence of blacks so that the story of the United States could be told adequately and fairly, end quote. 
John Hope Franklin. In the Jim Crow era, Franklin's arrival at the North Carolina archives as, quote, the first Negro who had sought to use the facilities there, this is 1968, right, is, quote, not so different from Farmer's tells her own encounters almost six decades later after Jim Crow segregation is supposed to have been eradicated, illegal, dead, and buried, and system not unlike apartheid. Farmer informs us that in the 21st century, she can, quote, recall multiple instances in which archivists and patrons look surprised and worried when I brought my majority black classes into the archives for a lesson. What is the experience of both Farmer and Franklin remind us is that archives are places, quote, where histories are recorded and written, but even at their best, they are imperfect reflections of an imperfect world. Inequities in whose writings are collected produce inequities in whose histories become known, and the failure of visions of one generation become failures for the next. That is from the brochure that we have, which you can get online. They have a small copy of it. But those were the words that Rob Cox wrote. He got it. So first and foremost, in my vision of a black feminist archive, we've codified that in a memorandum of understanding, which is highly unusual. I wanted to make sure that when I passed on, Rob's already passed on. I'm not going to be here forever. The person I'm working with may not be here forever. So how do I ensure that the principles of engagement that we started with are maintained? long after I'm gone. When I undertook to have SKUA host the BFA, which now includes 107 boxes of my materials, 397 digitized black and white photographs that I took between 1974 and 1991. They include photographs. I have 51 photos of James Baldwin, photographs of Sonia Sanchez, photographs of Tony K. Bumbara. I can tell you it's been a treasure trove. It's earned me about $5,000, which I have given over to the archive. But the one photograph of James Baldwin's mother has appeared on a new book called The Three Mothers. And it's a book about the mothers of Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and James Baldwin. Mine is the original photograph. That photograph has now appeared on Good Morning America, uh, The Today Show, Morning Joe, uh, you know, CNN. Uh, so I've had, and, and it's in a TED Talk now. So I've had great fun with that one photograph. And my photograph of Tony K. Mamara is going to appear as the author's photo on the back of a penguin is going to re-release one of her novels, The Soul Eaters. So I'm very happy that those black and white photos have like given life in many ways. And of course, I require that they show that they come from the archives. So it gives visibility. So with, when I undertook to have them do this, um, and Nancy Morhone, who's a Cuban poet, I approached them as a collaborator. So this is a collaboration. And they suggested that I also see the W.E.B. Du Bois Center, which is run by, directed by um, uh, Whitney Battle Baptiste, who's written a book called Black Feminist Archaeology, she's an archaeologist, uh, that we collaborate. So as part of that, what I've done is meet with, they have Du Bois Fellows. I meet with them, talk about archiving, encourage them to think about their work in that way. And my hope, is that we will soon have the McLaurin Black Feminist Archives Center as a counterpoint. What I talked to them about is, quote, our stories, our lives, our voices are too often disregarded, marginalized, and left on the cutting floors of films. The editing screens of books, old archivists have just ignored us. And this statement is in the brochure, and you can get that on my website. There's a drop down, there's one called Archive, and you can download the PDF of it. What I talk about is that it is a declaration on the state of archives as repositories historically of whiteness, reproducers of inequality, and an indictment of the role of archivists. That has now been a debate among people in archives. There's a whole discussion now. Uh, Canadian archivist Rodney G.S. Carter tells us that, quote, archives are filled with voices. Unfortunately, they do not contain our black voices. And there are places that pretend to be neutral, but indeed are what he calls, quote, undeniable spaces of power. Archives, undeniable spaces of power. As a result, archives of white institutions are filled with omissions and silences and are sites of white public power. Carter writes, quote, archival power is in part the power to allow voices to be heard. 
It consists of highlighting certain narratives and including certain types of records created by a certain group, end quote. And archives are the arbitrators of who gets to be included, what power which they have wielded and only expressed in famous black people. So let me just give you a little bit of data. Archivist is a profession that includes not just library archivists, but people who are in museums. Less than 4% in the United States of all archivists are black, less than 4%. Less than 3% are Latino, and less than 1% are indigenous or Native Americans. This is the recent statistic. The last time they did a study about diversity in the archival profession was in 2014. So that tells you how much interest they have in it. So part of the agenda of the Black Feminist Archive is to let it serve as a, as a training ground for black women archivists. And I've spoken with black women archivists. I gave a talk at Southern Connecticut University at a woman who was, I shall not name, at a very elite institution, Yale, that is there, <laughs> you know, came and talked about the frustration she, she felt because there's a hierarchy. Those who are most senior are going to be white and that they are gatekeepers. And so she was talking about leaving the profession. So we want to use the Black Feminist Archive as a training ground so that not only is it supporting and encouraging black women and others to go into becoming archivists, but also to give them material that they can connect with and that will resonate with their own experiences. So what I want to do is show the video. Because it will tell you so, to some degree of why I created the archive and why now. So if you take it up to slide show. some of the women. These are colleagues of mine, people that I've met. Uh, you saw uh, France Wynne Vance Twine. She's written a book on racism, uh, uh, the myth of a racial democracy about racism in Brazil, but she's also written about uh, reproductive rights. She now has a book, Girls with Guns. She runs a series. She's written over 80 or 90 referee journal articles and multiple books. I can't even keep up with all she's done. Dr. Keisha Scott, who just retired from Grinnell College, my alma mater. She was the first black woman to be tenured there. And she is someone who does what I call guerrilla teaching, where she gets people up and moving in the class, you know, to make theory and practices very real. Sharon Tumor, who I bumped into, and I said, 
That's really an interesting name. By the way, Arby, <coughs> yes, Gene Toomer, who was one of the writers of the Harlem Renaissance, a one book wonder, he wrote Kane, which at that point was considered a unique book because it was a fusion of poetry and prose, and it was very different, right? He could pass, and apparently he went, he, he wrote them, that one book, then became a Quaker, disappeared, and then apparently his children went to the Dominican Republic, so she's part Dominican and part African American. Recognize the name. Not many people have that name. Could you be connected? Yes. And so she has created a news uh, paper that she called Black and Brown. Where's it going to be archived? You know, because websites, once the person is gone, can disappear. So I'm talking to people about preserving that, right? We need this because. Every person, and this is what um, Ocean Dion, B-U-O-N-G, he's, he's actually now at my alma mater teaching in the MFA program. But I came across an interview with him in which he said, every person is an archon, and we often forget that. And I thought, perfect. That's what I want people to come across. And I have been asking people since I officially announced the archive in 2016, the university honored me as a distinguished alum. And as my gift back to them, I announced that I was putting the archive there. I've raised $25,000 on my own. I give contributions. I use my birthday. I make family. My nephew who passed away, I ask people to give in memory of his name. So it is now an endowed archive. And now I've asked the university to do its share, that they need to go after some big money in this. <coughs> But one of the most important things, I want to read you a quote from Rob that he wrote to me when he passed away. Before he passed away, I wrote him an email, and I didn't think he was going to answer because he was very weak. And you know, I said, I just want you to know that you're very much a part of this story, that your support, the fact that you heard me, was so important, and you've kind of been a champion. He personally digitized those 397 photos because he wanted to make sure they were done right, right? And he wrote me this, and I sent him the email he had sent me. He says, quote, yesterday is certainly one of those days I will remember thanks to you, and I cannot say enough how thrilled I am that you reached out to us. We have a saying in special collections that we don't have six degrees of separation in Western New England. It's more like two, and you'll prove. Your connections and ours seem to overlap in so many interesting ways with so many layers. And layers is what that overly long email will and it was, the subject was UMass Thanks You. It was Rob suggested that we collaborate with the Du Bois Center. And before he passed away, he, I wrote him, and at three in the morning, he wrote me two emails. One said, my fingers aren't quite working, let me start again. And then he said, You're, you've got momentum. It's like physics, he said, even though I'm not a physicist. He said, but you've got the momentum, you've got the historical archive grant, you know, things are starting to move, and you will have the support. And that was passed away the next morning. So the fact that he would take the time in what must have been a very painful uh, illness and, and reach out and say anything to me was very heartfelt. And those correspondence between he and I about the archive, we wrote that he designed that little miniature brochure, maybe we can pass it around later. Um, it will come out as a big one, but it's actually a little miniature. He designed it, he helped write the text, we co collaborated on writing grants. And it is so important to have people who believe in what you're doing, who can hear what you're saying. But he never asserted himself as having the authority and the power over this. He always let me have the lead. And one of the things that I've had to push back against, I mean, he said, oh, well, this should come from the university. I was like, well, I didn't have a problem with you sending out stuff. Mm -hmm. So we need to talk about what that means and, and why you feel that way. I don't need to usurp your problem. I've been a university president. You know, I've done what I need to do. I'm just trying to make sure that my archive is handled in a particular kind of way. So we've, we've had to have some conversations because, you know, we're working with different people and we have to create that relationship. I speak to you today at a critical juncture because uh, we're at a particular moment in America's cultural heritage narrative. There are legislative assaults on things like the 1619 Project, critical race theory, which actually is not taught in K through 12, but people keep saying you can't teach it in K through 12. 
it was never taught in K through 12. You know, so people are just using this thinly disguised efforts to resurrect what I call a dominant white master narrative rooted in white supremacy as if it were the only truth. My archive is intended to disrupt this campaign. If we cannot rely on children to get access to truthful information in schools, there has to be alternative places and primary materials where teachers can come and parents can come and children can come to find out that there were actually people writing things that run counter to that master narrative becomes really important. They may succeed in limiting what is taught in schools, and so archives become powerful resources for people to discover and recover versions of history and social reality by researching original sources. And a friend of mine used to do this. She taught at community college, but she always required her students to do some original research. And a lot of that research came to formulate a sort of black um, walking tour of Springfield, where John Brown, who was one of the people who fought uh, against slavery, he was hung for his work, uh, was born in Springfield, Massachusetts, who knew? There is nothing more powerful than children or people discovering the, the material that you can find in archives, the notes, the comments. I remember seeing Zora's material, which she was invited to, to contribute to the Meineke by Carl Van Vechten, the photographer. One of his friends, uh, Johnson, Charles S. Johnson had passed away. He wanted to commemorate him with an archive. So he invited Zora, he invited Langston Hughes, so they contributed their stuff, their telegrams. She used to write poetry, she used to make Christmas cards. All these materials are in there, and her niece did a book, Lucy Hurston did a book, that's like a pop-up book where they actually made facsimiles of all these things, right? And so, who knew that about Zora? But what was most critical to me is that there is a narrative among men, black men, historians of the Harlem Renaissance, that Zora was just this problematic person, you know, the historical woman boy kind of approach to her. And she's always presented as this sort of off-the-wall person. The letters between her and Langston Hughes, we don't have her, we have her letters to him, we don't have his responses, but they show a very deep relationship. And what they also showed me I've been in search of Zora's anthropological notebooks, right? Her field notes. They don't exist. They probably, she used to put stuff in storage, didn't have money to get it out. By now, they would have appeared, they're gone. But what her letters do is that she wrote to him about the research she was doing. So her, uh, her, her concepts, her way of looking at the research was embedded in those letters. So I was able to extract from that sort of her methodology and how she was thinking about things. And I'll give you an example. She was trained as a poor field anthropologist, so she was looking at language, she used to run around measuring people's heads, physical anthropology. She was interested in material culture, but she also had a, an understanding that the southern black part of the United States was part of a di diaspora. She didn't have that language, but she knew there was a connection between the South and the Bahamas and the Honduras. And she was making connections between songs and music she was finding in the American South and material that she was finding in the Bahamas. And I contend that had she finished her PhD, it would have been the first black PhD in black studies or Negro studies at that point. So she was sort of making these connections and you're seeing that in her research. She used to read to people who were working in citrus camps. She used to read to them poems by Langston Hughes. They would then pick up the guitar and start stringing string of music, and then they'd recite the poem. And so she'd write back to Lane say, they love this poem, they didn't like that one, right? <laughs> but she's showing, and you have to understand, the turpentine camps where people were probably breathing in fumes and killing themselves, citrus camps, this is like one step above slavery. They may be working for themselves, but they're not earning this money, and the conditions they're working under, she was her happiest in the field, and she was able to find that. All that material is in her archives, in her letters, not in her books, you know, not in the formal stuff we see published, but in the materials of archives. And so what I want to do, I see the, the Black Feminist Archive as my living legacy. And this is something that a friend of mine, Erlene Belton, who's been my coach and friend, defines as, quote, what you do in your living moments to contribute to the life you leave behind. A living legacy is, quote, 
what you do in your living moments to contribute to the life you leave behind. What I plan to leave behind in the Black Feminist Archive is a unique donor-driven enterprise. It is my vision and passion to celebrate black women and uplift voices that have been rendered silent far too long. You saw the picture of Miss Archie Jones, 97. She passed away in March. And she made her daughter, she, they didn't know what to do with her. There was no such thing as black women anthropologists working in the fields in the 1940s. But she continued to do her research. She shared with the community. And she made her daughter, who's an artist, promise that she would take care of her material. And what I've said to her is when the briefing is done, I will personally come to your house and help you pack up and we will pay to make sure that her materials are caught. Her mother was, she grew in and out of lucidity, but the, the article that I wrote called Visible Black Woman Visible and Her had her photograph in it, her young, and the one that I took, and she said her mother was so tickled, you know, that her name was in there, and she said, people would call her doctor, and she said, but mommy, not doctor, she said, it's okay, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what they want to see me as, and she, she deserved it. So it's for people like her, people who weren't necessarily famous, but who were doing the work and in some ways on whose backs we stand. I've been able to, as I said, to fill in gaps about Zora. I want to use my, my archive as a training ground, as I've said, for black women. But I see it as a reparative protector and preserver. And I want to quote a friend of mine. I came across an article by Colin Prescott, who's a black rent sociologist who then worked for the BBC. And he'd written a whole talk on reparative histories, uh, archives as reparative histories. Who knew? I'm doing archives, and then someone that I haven't talked to in like 25, 30 years is talking about archives. There's something going on there, right? And he talks about reparative histories. He describes these as connections between archives, race, class, and rage. Prescott declares that, quote, archives and records are part of the project of contesting the dominant historical narratives that marginalize and exclude and must be corrected. This is my entry point into the archive environment. It is not as an archivist, where I do not claim to be that. Rather, I enter the archive landscape as an activist, an interventionist, and as the founder of the Irma McLaurin Black Feminist Archive. It is to prove that archives can become tools of power too, in contrast of power over, and also sites of inclusiveness. From this position, I have turned my black rage, of which Prescott speaks, into my own black feminist rage that I see as a form of activism that is a counterpoint of corrective. Oops, here you go. A reparative to the dominant narratives of whiteness that have shaped archives up to this moment. We are never alone. This archival journal, its journey is not just mine. I seek to prove that there is a powerful black sisterhood that is local, national, and global. And I've been recruiting women from South Africa. So let me finish by saying, in building this archival home for black women, I am offering sanctuary, safety, and opportunity to be in community with other black women, even when our bones have turned to dust. Because of the, the archive, black women will be able to self-curate their lives. So Sheila Walker, who's amassed over 5,000 slides and hundreds of footage of archival material about the black presence in Latin America, and yes, there are black people in Argentina, contrary to what it presents as a white Latino country, there were black people there in Nicaragua, in Chile, in all of these places, there was a black presence. It's just been erased, and she has been documenting that. She just delivered her slides and digital content. She has also a historical archive grant. And then she interviewed, and she's like, she would be writing me, I get things at one in the morning, saying, oh, look what I discovered. This is just so wonderful. I mean, once you start, it is like, it is more than an excavation. It is a personal deep dive into your personal history. And you begin to see things and remember things and understand that you've done this amazing work. I plan to make the McLaurin Black Feminist Archive Center, I hope, the largest home in the world for materials about black women. And I'll close with that.